Uh, freaking broke. Oh, what the f? Oh, you know what? In the last episode of the Fiero series, some pretty big milestones were hit. Painting for the car finally wrapped up, and nothing at all went wrong during that process. The few first body panels were mounted up on the car, and the interior was pretty much finished up, where again, nothing went wrong. Good. All in all, the car is starting to look great again. If you consider 80s design great, that is. I didn't get the chance to finalize the headliner last time because I lost the rubber strip that secures it in place up top. It may be nice to order parts two years in advance, but also maybe don't do that. I got another one now though, so let's finish this up. To start, I trimmed back the headliner so that there was only enough excess to fit inside the groove that it's going to live in. I didn't want to do that to the whole thing in case anything went wrong and I needed to adjust my method, so I just did a test here. Pressing in the rubber molding by hand is an absolute pain. It might be easier with a bit more pressure. There we go! That actually worked really well. I guess time to repeat that all the way around. so annoying to do but it really isn't that bad in the grand scheme of things but I still don't like doing it beautiful oh yeah that's pretty dang clean oh and speaking of headliners looking clean I repaired the hole kind of a lot of you guys suggested to just cut a little circle out of the excess headliner and glue it in there. So, I did that. I probably should have used fabric glue or something like that, because the super glue I used got a little crusty when it dried, but hey, filling a hole is filling a hole. It's definitely better than before. I ended the last episode by saying there was still something that I need to take care of in the interior and that I was looking forward to your guesses on what that might be. The first piece of criteria that I gave as a hint was that it currently wasn't installed in the car. So for everyone that guessed the cracked windshield, the most guesses I got were the missing rear view mirror. But that's not it, because the second piece of criteria that I gave was that it was super important that I take care of it. And according to the Texas state government, a rear view mirror on the inside is not important at all because you're not legally required to have one. I am still going to take care of that, but that wasn't what I was talking about. Another really good guess that I got from a handful of people that is something that is important and seemingly missing is the emergency brake, the parking brake. Because yeah, where is it? Every single vehicle pretty much that has a hand actuated parking brake is right here. But it's not here in the Fiero. It's right here, down by the seat. It is engaged right now, but it falls back down. So a lot of people don't know that it's there because it's always hidden. And if you're wondering why it falls back down, it's because if it stayed up, how most e-brakes are, you would probably sodomize yourself trying to get inside the car. So, it's not the windshield. It's not the e-brake. What is it? Seat belt buckles. Gotta take care of the seat belt buckles. Yeah, I haven't been running seat belts in this car. Only seat belt. One is fine, and the other one... This one was the driver's side. If you remember, the driver's side seat rail was completely rusted out and I had to replace it, as well as the actual seat base. It only made sense that this was also bad. The bottom completely rotted away, and the plastic became so brittle it just fell apart. Now I did actually buy a replacement set over a year ago, but there was a slight issue of those new ones not being able to buckle. 
buckles are actually supposed to buckle. You probably didn't know that. I originally chose to not worry about it, and I just ran the good one from the passenger side over on the driver's side for me. But now that I'm actually at the point where I'm finishing the car, maybe it should be addressed. After staring at these over many days, I realized that the new one from a later model Fiero is actually a bit longer than the original one. But looking even closer, the slot where the actual latching mechanism starts seems to be at the same height on both. On the shorter one, it's a pretty shallow slope, and on the taller one, it's much steeper. Because of that, it seems that the only reason this isn't latching is because the walls of the buckle are running into the taller plastic walls of the new buckle. Wait, which one is the buckle exactly? Lucky for me, I got these as a set, so I had no issue tearing apart one of them to compare. And side by side, the mechanisms look the exact same. Same shape, same spring placement, and metal tabs all in the same spot. It's just the black plastic housing that's different. I'm thinking that taking these apart, swapping the black piece from the original over to the new one, and putting the rest back together will be enough to get it actually clicking in place now. Okay. Theoretically, this should be the exact same as what the Fiero came with. Let's go see if this works. I guess now, the gray plastic can go back on. But as it is, it wouldn't be matching so much with the tan of the other one. Also, there's the fact that the plastic cover for the strap on the other one is crumbling away too. So that's gonna be replaced with the gray strap piece from the other new buckle. Ugh, oh, jeez Louise. But before I went and did any color matching, I first took care of a little bit of surface rust that was on the passenger side. A little bit of wire wheel action, rust converter action, and we're ready to now start making these look like a pair. After getting everything either masked up or attached to a metal wire, they were all hit with more of that vinyl and fabric spray paint from the last episode because I had so much of it left over from spraying the speaker covers. I also went ahead and gave the buckle housings a couple coats of clear, just because I know that they'll be touched a lot more than the strap section. And after a bit of dry time, we're left with this. Wow, that's really, uh, underwhelming. Oh, yeah it is. Not to worry, a little bit of masking, red paint, and three coats of clear because this is a heavily touched item. And we're left with this. I feel really weird about being excited over how seat belt buckle receptacles look, but here we are. I'm sure I would feel even more weird with these fully together, except that... Oh my god, it's all just peeling off. Yeah, that's not good at all. That interior paint did not want to stick to the strap section. Okay, for round two, I actually sandblasted these bare, thoroughly cleaned them with degreaser, pre-installed them onto the straps, and then spread adhesion promoter this time before the interior paint. After undoing all the masking, oh yeah. These look good. The outer shell for what was the taller piece is now sticking a little bit lower with the original piece now on, but hey, you'll never see these side by side again. Unless, of course, you go back and watch this video again. Those that know Fieros could probably tell you that this wasn't stock just by looking at it. Fieros only came in shades of gray and tan for the buckles. I think black works though. There's so many other black trim pieces in here anyways, it doesn't really stand out at all. It's just a buckle after all, it's already a very neutral thing. More than it looking good, I'm mainly happy that me and my co-pilot are now going to be less likely to die in the event of a collision. Nice. Maybe. The only thing left for the interior is the door panels. But like I explained in the last episode, those can't go on until after the outside mirrors go on since the interior panels block access to the nuts that secure them on. 
and those mirrors can't go on until after the outer door panels go on, and for those to go on, we have to address this pile of parts first. Aside from some of the retaining plates that secure the door skin being a little rusty, one of them has half a bolt stuck inside it. I actually completely forgot I had to drill this out when taking everything apart almost a year ago. That is a problem. I initially tried welding a nut to the stud inside, but that really doesn't work if you also weld the nut to the outside material too. I ended up just making... art. So that was chucked into the vise and cut off entirely, because I remembered the rivnut gun I bought for the interior trim also came with rivnuts of assorted sizes, one of them being the same M6 thread size that the rest of the interior mounting plates have. So I drilled the hole to be bigger, but I made it too big, so I drilled a washer to the correct size and added that to the pile. The plate was sandblasted clean, then everything got sandwiched together, and the rivnet squeezed down. And hey, the factory bolt still threads in perfectly. It wasn't until lining up the rest of the plates that I realized each door actually has two short plates and one tall plate. I got extremely lucky because I just so happened to have repaired the taller one of the three and it's just about the same height as the factory one. So it should pretty much be a perfect repair. The rest of the plates are a little rusty looking so those two were cleaned up along with the larger plates and pretty much every piece of hardware for the doors until we're left with this. Everything definitely looks a lot better than before, but cleaning up alone isn't enough for these pieces. These little rods need a little something on the end. See, these are the actuating rods for opening the doors. It slots into the latch mechanism right here in a lever, and the hinging of the handle pushes it down, opening the door. The issue it has is that it rattles around a lot as is. From the factory, this metal rod wasn't just painted, it also had a rubberized coating at the bottom. I took that off when sandblasting, so to replace it, I'll be adding a piece of heat shrink over the top of it. Now it's snug as a bug with no rattles to hear. The next thing is pretty important to take care of, and that's the lock cylinders for the doors. Technically, this side is fine, besides that little door plate that just flew off, but the passenger side one is completely mangled inside. Replacements for these are cheap though. Now you may be asking, won't the keys for these be different than the key for the trunk lock cylinder? And yes, but don't forget that I already had to replace the trunk lock cylinder after drilling the original one out, so there are already different keys for both. And you may ask now, since you had to buy two for the doors, why didn't you just buy three for not much more to have matching set all the way around? Well, you can just shut your fu- There's one last thing to take care of, and it's also a little bit important. Do you remember back when I had to repair this because I had to drill out the stuck bolt? Well, I had to drill out a stuck bolt. The Fiero only has two instances of proprietary bolts that exist on no other vehicle, and this is one of them. It's technically just a regular bolt, yes, but it's embedded inside the plastic washer during the manufacturing process. New ones of these are not produced. But that's not a problem for this day and age. With the help of 3D printing, a suitable replacement can be made. Not too shabby looking. That plastic dip outside really matches the rubberized coating of the original. Why GM didn't just use a countersunk bolt and make the plastic washer separate like I did, who knows. But this should work a treat. And yeah, I couldn't find a countersunk Torx head locally, so I just opted for Phillips. Which is actually how the 84 Fieros had them, so it's still kind of factory. Just the wrong gear. Also, for the 9 people that followed my channel before my Fiero series, yes, this was made with Jankbot, my DIY printer. It's the same one as before, I just kind of ship of Theseus him to be where he is now. Same soul, just a different body. He's happy though. No, I'm not. Shut up.
shut up. I don't like what I've become. I was happy the way I was. I don't care how you feel. You have to kill me. Please, just kill me. Kill me! With this pile of parts done, we're ready to start mounting the doors. The long boy. Yeah, that one goes in the top front corner of the panel. Now, if you have superhuman observation skills, you might have noticed on the bench that there were seven bolts for each side, but only six threaded spots on the plates. That's because one plate was secured in place with a very annoying retainer that I didn't bother taking off, so it's been on the door panel the whole time. Lazy? Maybe. But who am I to judge? Next, a tiny piece of molding goes on because it's bolted in place from the inside and you won't have access later. Then I went ahead and replaced all of the foam strips that run along the front and back edges of the panel. The originals were mostly intact, but taking the extra few minutes to go ahead and do this was not enough of an inconvenience to warrant me not taking care of it at all. The real challenge for fitting this panel on is dealing with both of the actuating rods for the latch mechanism. This one for the handle slots in like I previously showed, which is tough enough to line up as it is, but it's even tougher when you limit your motion after installing the actuating rod for the lock cylinder. Yikes. After doing the passenger side door off camera and struggling for half an hour there, I figured out how to only struggle for a few minutes, and that's by removing the hinging plate for the lock cylinder and installing it on the door first. That way, instead of struggling with this mess here over on the door frame and vertically, might I add, you just have to snap the rod in place through the hole, which is easy. And there's no real visibility here at all, so unfortunately I couldn't fit a camera anywhere where you could see everything go together. After a lot of fiddling, I got it. It still has some wiggle room, not being bolted down at all, so after measuring and copying the panel gap and alignment from the passenger side, where I already verified everything lines up, even with the quarter panel, I clamped everything down and started securing it. There's two plastic chunks, I guess, just mounted to the door frame. One in the back and one in the front. There's just one screw that goes into each of them. The front one was a little offset from the original hole, so either the plastic chunk moved slightly or the factory alignment was bad. Either options are very likely. And this one also has a little bracket that helps hold on the side molding. And now it's time to put those proprietary bolts in place and fully secure this panel. A few of those bolts were tightened up, but then I saw the panel alignment wasn't quite right anymore, with everything pulled down tight and all. Things moved a bit, so I loosened the side bolts, adjusted everything, and then it looked pretty good. The bolts for the front were added as well, and then there was the one last bolt to install. The DIY one. You know, as cool as 3D printing custom parts is, it's even cooler if you do it correctly. The issue was that the original version I made just had a flat bottom, not at all reminiscent of the factory one. I chalked it up, being the way it is, to just the nature of injection molding, where forms pretty much have to be thin, but it turns out that those details were there for a reason. The inner ring is because the nipple of the mounting plate actually protrudes through the hole when tightened down, so this recess allows for that clearance. The outer recessed ring is there so that there's a thin outer skirt which can bend and deform to conform to the curves of the door panel. This goes to show you that designing things is very easy, but designing things well takes a bit more brain usage. And speaking of lack of brain usage, I may have forgotten to tighten down the front bolts after that panel adjustment I did. Meaning the bracket for the molding is loose, 
meaning the molding is loose. <laughs> and when trying to pull it back off to fix it, I God. shattered that very bracket and one of the clips in the middle section. Damn it! Luckily, I somehow managed to not break the original one the car had and I kept it around all this time, so I was able to install that. And I also had another one of those middle clips lying around too. <laughs> that is a lot better. And last but not least, there's one teeny tiny little pin to hold the back section in. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And on this left now are the mirrors. These are both manual adjustment mirrors, however, they have slightly different mechanisms for allowing them to rotate about. For the passenger side, there's curved ribs in the mirror housing that correspond to a spherical detail on the back of the mirror plate. There's one more spherical piece to press against the mirror plate, and what provides the clamping force to hold everything still is a spring held on by a nut. There's enough force to hold it in place, but not enough to where you can't move it around if you need to. On the driver's side, everything is cable actuated. There's a little bracket that slots into a plus shape receptacle on the housing that can rotate left and right, and that bracket has a living hinge built into it for the up and down movement. The cables pass through some holes and snap into place on the mirror plate. There's still a spring for applying the clamping force for holding everything together, but that's placed remotely at the adjustment knob that'll be mounted on the door panel. The passenger side mirror is going to be rebuilt first, since it's literally just one nut to tighten down. But there's a slight problem right out the bat. There's a plastic washer that goes between the mirror housing and the mirror plate, and mine just crumbled away. I was looking around for a durable yet thin and flexible piece of plastic to use, when I realized that the blister pack for the replacement mirror glass would be perfect. I traced it, cut it out, accidentally cut too far and split the whole thing. Ugh. You can... Oh my goodness. And traced it and cut it out once more. To help increase some of the friction force, I scuffed up the plastic so it wouldn't be so glossy smooth. Then it's just a matter of putting it all together and tightening the nut down. And I know it's a thread cutting nut that binds into the metal, but I still added a little bit of thread locker to it. I told myself it was helping. Nice. The driver's side one is a bit more complicated than that. Besides just the cables being a pain to work with, you also have to put them in the correct holes. If you look very closely, you can just make out colors on the end of them. Red, yellow, and green. On the housing, there's a corresponding R, Y, and G. Get these mixed around and movement of the adjustment knob up might result in the mirror moving down and to the left. I figured out it was easiest to unbolt the little mounting plate, super glue the cable sleeves in place, just the sleeves though, you still want the cable to move, and then bolt it back up afterward. To make it so that I could feed the cables through the mirror plates, I compressed the spring at the adjustment knob and wedged a screwdriver in the housing to keep it compressed. That way all the cables are extended as far as possible. Wrapping this up should just be a matter of adhering the mirror glass, but as we have come to learn on my channel, it is never that easy. What the f The replacement mirror I bought doesn't fit within the walls of the mirror plate. Why? Oh, you know what? This is probably one of those replacements that's designed to go over top the original mirror. Hello! Ronnie from the future here, and this indeed was a mirror replacement that's supposed to go over top the original mirror. Here is an actual stock replacement meant to replace the stock one entirely. And if I line up the bottom corners, you can see that the lower one is indeed a little bit bigger. I was wondering at first why you would have something that's just designed to go over top something else like this. Thought it was really ridiculous, but then I remember there's an entire generation of people that put linoleum over hardwood floors, so I guess I really can't be surprised. All right, let's go back to the past where I didn't yet buy the correct one. 
I'm gonna go ahead and install this thing now and worry about the glass later. The cables were fed through the door and moved around the window guide, and then the mirror was bolted down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I completely forgot that another step to securing the door panels is plastic riveting the bottom edge. After doing the same on the other side, we're left with a couple of good looking doors. Especially the one that actually has the glass in the mirror. Something I forgot to do when installing the new felt window guides was fine tune their placement. I kinda just bolted them up. The process to adjust them is to run the window halfway down, then push the guide back if it's too tight or forward if it's too loose. That's pretty good as is actually, holy crap, never mind. On the passenger side I had to adjust these, but... Wow, that's spot on. Well, alright. Anyway, now we can finally install the rest of the interior components. The first thing to go back on are some little rubber end pieces. There was some sealant from the factory on these, so I added more of that weather stripping sealant and adhesive left over from the sunroof seal. Now for the inner dew wipe. Slide that on, place the retention plate over it, and screw that down. After doing everything for the passenger side too, it's now time for the inside door panels. The driver's side is gonna be a little different than this. Firstly, the mirror cables naturally want to be straight, and making it do a U-turn causes it to exert a lot of pressure on the door panel. To make that pressure exert onto itself, I secured it with some cable ties. That's a heck of a lot better. One more problem though. 35 years of that cable applying a decent amount of force onto a door panel made out of cheap particle board crap is going to take its toll. Especially because GM can be dumb sometimes. Right here, at the adjustment knob mount, is where the cable exerts all the force. And GM only used two washers to hold the mirror adjustment knob to the panel. That means that the only thing holding the door panel in its intended shape is this teeny tiny bit of material here. And that's not gonna do anything. GM, why? Why? So instead of one crappy washer on opposing corners, I'm going to make a strengthening plate that spans the whole length. It's no Nick Blackhurst creation, far from it I know, but this will still work perfectly. This is seriously better. Another example of a loose hole just needing to be paired with something large and stiff for everything to be okay. Now with that on, that's the very last work for the interior. Me actually finishing things is a nice change of pace. So with that momentum that I have right now, I'm going to keep going. Now I want to install the little trim pieces here for the rear clip, but doing that on the driver's side would block very important access needed for the gas cap release mechanism, so let's start with that first. I was wondering why it wasn't really wanting to open up after pulling the latch inside. I mean, the latch works and the cap releases, but I still have to pry it out. After a good night's sleep, I realized I forgot to install the spring that actually pushes it open. Oh yeah. Okay, now for the trim. Wow. I definitely should have painted that part. Alright, I painted the part. These vents do have to come off later when installing the deck lid, but I wanted to get an idea of how it's all coming together now. 
Also, the screws that hold these down are the other proprietary piece of Fiero hardware. There's been holy grail jokes made about these since they go missing so often. I actually only have one for each side instead of two. But these jokes are now null. After decades of having to source them used, the Fiero store just started making new ones. But like, they're $17 for a pair and I don't have that kind of money just for screws. Especially after spending $60 on light bulbs. Before fitting these trim panels on, I actually realized that the license plate lights were underneath the rear bumper bar. Visibility of these is probably best when they're not completely hidden from sight. I was taking my time looking at these after getting them out, and also the rest of the lights around them, and many of the bulbs are broken, and the ones that aren't are still 35 years old. They should probably be replaced. So after swapping all of those out, we have running lights. Reverse left signal, right signal, but not the license plate lights. It turned out to just be some dirty contacts for the bulb. So after cleaning them off by running the light bulbs up and down, which is definitely the correct way to clean them, they work. Sweet. The brake lights work too, but I forgot to show that. And after this, I went on a binge of replacing every other bulb for the exterior. Only one of the side marker lights actually worked when I got the car, so these all definitely needed to be replaced. <laughs> Alright. Now that my light bulb tangent is over, let's get back to mounting body panels. Slight issue! I'm just now realizing, as I'm writing the script for this narration, that the reflectors for the rear bumper that go in these holes have to be secured from the inside, and there's no access to them after it's installed, so I'm gonna have to take this all the way off and add them back on later. Fantastic. time for the taillights, but not these broken disgusting ones. And also not these slightly less broken and disgusting ones. Well, yes, actually those, but with these. Rose and Alex over at the Lightspeed Fierro's YouTube channel once again save the day. Well, actually the gas tank they gave me turned out to be bad, so this is actually the first time they saved the day. But regardless, I've got some brand new used lenses for these, and they're really gonna make my rear end look great or at least better than it already looks now. And speaking of shoutouts, Andrew over at the Avalon King YouTube channel also has a series where he's working on a Fiero, and he has an entire video on restoring this exact style of lens. Watching that was a great help for me for sure. That video, along with Alex and Rose's channel, is going to be linked down below if you want to check it out. The excess adhesive strips around the edges were removed, and then I used more of that weather stripping adhesive and sealant around the entire perimeter. I really want to get my money's worth for this thing. I would say this is a slight improvement. But that could just be me. <laughs> Absolutely an improvement. I can't believe I was contemplating keeping the originals when this project started. After struggling with the lights for far longer than it should have taken me. Oh. My. Gosh, let's keep putting panels on the car because I know if I don't I'm just going to be staring at the rear end for hours and never get anything done. So... Let's put this panel on. This panel is really straightforward. Wow, it totally blocks the camera's view. It's just a matter of riveting a few rivets into place. Snipping off the excess of the plastic ones. Riveting some more, and snipping off some more. Then with a new clip popped in the trim panel, it snapped in place and held firmly with a little retainer pin in the front. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Ah. Look at that! Holy crap! The driver's side panel is largely the same. The only real difference is that this side has the air intake for the engine. I think from the factory this rubber flange is supposed to go around this panel here, especially because it has two holes up at the top where the little mounting screws for the grill would pass through, 
but this was just so old and petrified, it really was not wanting to conform to that shape. So, I just didn't worry about it. There's still air that's gonna get in here just fine. But this little grill that goes here is looking kind of faded, so I painted that bad boy. Percy, what's going on? These look good. The back end is so close to being done. The biggest piece missing is the deck lid. Let's get that thing on there. Back when installing the rear clip, I had to remove the original trunk seal. So there's a new one that's gotta go on now. There was a very big gap though. That definitely does not seem right. But that's a problem for future Ronnie. Present Ronnie is gonna install this thing. With some wonderful mom help, I got the deck lid into place and bolted up. Thank you so much. You At least bolted up enough to prevent it from falling off. I still had to shimmy it around to get the panel gaps looking good. The next step is installing the latch to hold this thing in place. I just remembered this has to go in first. Classic. Hmm, it's pretty tight. If it was any looser, it'd be a lot taller and the body lines wouldn't match up, so... Maybe now that the trunk is finished, I can clean out all of the junk that's in here, old parts and whatnot, and actually put some nice things in here. Things like, I don't know, a Fingerprints Workshop VR t-shirt available for purchase. This is actually starting to look pretty put together, except slightly naked looking. And that's because of the lack of a luggage rack. Let's install that, shall we? The first thing to go in are the rubber well nuts. Then the DIY gasket can be stuck onto the rack piece, and then just bolt it up. The same thing was done for the other side as well. For the rest of the rack, that was assembled over at the bench. Then everything from before was repeated here as well. With all the bolts tightened down, there's one final step to finishing these off. And that's capping them with what's called a luggage rack buffer. The original rubber that went here pretty much entirely crumbled away when I was taking everything off the car. And all that is left of that that I hadn't thrown away was this tiny little remnant here of the rubber strip, and it just went inside there, but it was of course the entire length, but uh, they don't make this anymore, at least not this exact one for the Fiero. The Fiero store doesn't sell a replacement, and I had to spend hours upon hours on the internet finding the right rubber or plastic profile that could fit in this, and after a long, long time, I got this. It's a bit of a different shape than what was stock, but it should still do the trick. I did find a lot of things that might have worked, but those possible solutions were actually only from the manufacturer of the rubber profiles where the intended customer were our companies buying in bulk. My saving grace for this was an eBay listing for RV trailer vinyl insert window trim flexible screw cover sold at 99 cents a foot. I paid like 10 bucks for this, not bad at all. So, after giving my thumbs an insane workout getting this to fit in place, we are finally done with the back of the car. More or less, at least. There's still some little things like those reflectors I forgot about, as well as- Oh, that's right, the mirror for the driver's side. Look. At. This. Look at this! Oh, this is so good! Now, I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but... Do you remember how this thing looked when I got it? The car is almost brand new again. At least in the back half. 
And no, it's really not as simple as throwing the front panels on and replacing the glass. Don't be so unrealistic and demanding, Steven. I should say, there's so much more to do before this car is done right. And you'll see so much more in the next episode. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later.